Donald and a class of 1998 graduate. Um, I have seen her give a similar presentation to what she's doing today and absolutely loved it. So um, if you have to do an ethics presentation on a Saturday morning, this is the one to do. Um, so welcome to Carolyn. Let's give her a warm welcome back to Boulder. Thanks, Marcy, and thank you very much for getting up early in the morning on a weekend to listen to an ethics presentation, everyone's favorite subject. Um, I put this presentation together using real world examples. I called it Rip from the Headlines because I like to read about legal ethics and professional responsibility, and it seems like every day I see news articles about lawyers, sometimes really good lawyers at really good firms, doing really stupid things. And I thought, what better way to teach people about ethics than to use some of these examples and use real world examples of people doing things that they shouldn't do and getting in trouble as a result. Um, you hear things about ethics and you think, oh, well, that would never happen to me. I would never do that. It happens. People do it. And so that's why I wanted to talk about these things here. I'm pretty sure none of the people I'm talking about are in this audience. Um, if you are, I'm really sorry and hopefully you learn something from it. So first of all, lesson number one, I'm gonna have 10 lessons over the course of this presentation, and a lot of it's gonna sound really simple. It's gonna sound like things you should have learned as a first year law student or maybe back in kindergarten. Lesson number one, I'm gonna call, if it's really important, double check it, triple check it. If it matters, make sure that you're going back and being careful in your work. Easy enough, right? First, the ethics rules that are potentially applicable. So keep an eye open for rule number 1.1. This is rule of professional conduct that relates to competence. You have a duty to provide competent representation to your clients. And that involves a couple of things. First, you have to have the knowledge or the experience to adequately provide the services and advice that your client needs. You can either have that by having done it before and learned through experience, or you could study up. And even a new lawyer can be as competent as an experienced lawyer based on what they're doing. But it also means that you have to have the thoroughness and the pre preparation that's necessary to do the job well. So keep an eye open for that. And 5.1, responsibilities of a partner or supervising lawyer. So if you are a managing partner of a firm, you have an obligation to put in place procedures that will ensure people are complying with their ethical obligations. And if you are a supervising lawyer, you're working with younger lawyers, you have an obligation to make sure that they are complying with the rules of professional conduct. And in fact, you can be responsible for one of your subordinates' violations of a rule of professional conduct. You can be directly responsible if you direct them to do it, if you ratify the fact that they've done it, or if you learned that they've done it and you had an opportunity to fix the problem and you didn't go in and fix it. So you wanna make sure you know what the people who are working with you are doing. Similarly, non-lawyer assistance, the same kind of rule as a supervisor, whether part of management in a firm or someone who is running a client matter, you have an obligation to supervise the non-lawyer staff who work with you. So keep an eye out for those rules as I go through this example. So here's a case study of anything that can go wrong, might go wrong. In this case, and this is a real world case, all of these are, everything I'm gonna talk about here today, these are things that actually have happened. These are true facts. So here's a loan transaction. The borrower is General Motors. And General Motors is represented in this transaction by Mayor Brown, one of the largest law firms in the world. Very well known, very well respected firm. They're borrowing money from JP Morgan. JP Morgan is part of a syndicate of lenders. They're being represented by Simpson Thatcher. Again, very well known, very well respected law firm. There are two loans at issue here. The first loan is a $300 million loan. And in exchange for lending the $300 million, the lenders are gonna get collateral. And their collateral is going to be 12 pieces of real estate. And 
they're going to be secured through UCC1 financing statements that are filed for the 12 pieces of real estate. Simple enough. Five years later, GM is borrowing more money, this time real money, $1.5 billion. Different syndicate of lenders, JP Morgan is in that lending group as well, however. So JP Morgan is on both loans. The collateral for loan number two is massive. It involves massive amounts of GM assets located at 42 different facilities. And GM asked Mayor Brown, because let's fast forward a year, they're getting ready to pay off loan number one. They say, okay, we need to release the security that we have for loan number one. So basically, release the security on the 12 pieces of real estate. That's what we want to do. They had not paid off loan number two, the $1.5 billion loan, just loan number one. So here's the first mistake. So the Mayor Brown partner assigns an associate to draft the documents. Now that's not a mistake. We're, gonna, we're getting ready to get there. I actually think it's a really good thing to assign things to associates. The associate in turn delegates to a paralegal and asks the paralegal to do a search in Delaware for any UCC1 financing statements recorded against GM. Here's where things fall apart. Nobody tells the paralegal why they're asking her to do the search. Nobody tells her what they're really looking for other than just find every UCC1 financing statement. The paralegal actually does a really good job. She says there's three of them. She identifies UCC1 financing statements for loan number one, and she identifies the ones that were filed for loan number two. And so she goes back to the associate and says, here's the UCC ones. The associate then drafts a closing checklist where he lists all of the UCC ones, and he drafts documents to release all of the UCC ones. So next mistake. He sends it to the partner who he's working with who doesn't notice the mistake, who doesn't look to see are these the right financing statements that we're releasing for a $1.5 billion loan. And one thing that the comments to Rule 1.1, the competence rule say is that your duty to exercise thoroughness, your duty to prepare in representing a client can be related to the size of the deal. Is it a huge piece of litigation? Is it a huge deal? The bigger the deal, the more you have an obligation to make sure that you're being thorough in your work. So the Mayor Brown Associate gets the blessing of the partner, sends it off to Simpson Thatcher, who represents the, uh, the lender, J.P. Morgan. And he doesn't notice the mistake either. And he writes back, nice, job on the documents. And guess what? All of the UCC3 termination statements are filed. Every piece of collateral is released, including the collateral for the $1.5 billion loan. So there's no more security. It's all gone. Maybe it's no harm, no fall, right? GM files for bankruptcy, receives federal TARP money, yay for GM, and has money to pay back the lenders for loan number two, based on an assumption that they have perfected security interest. Nobody has identified the problem at this point in time. So JP Morgan gets paid back, it's 1.5, everybody's happy, until a very eagle-eyed lawyer who's representing a committee of unsecured creditors in the bankruptcy is actually looking at these documents. And this eagle-eyed lawyer says, wait a minute, JP Morgan and the other lenders are unsecured lenders. They don't get the money. It has to be distributed to all the unsecured creditors. And this lawyer starts efforts to claw back the $1.5 billion. So, as you can imagine, litigation ensues over that. And J.P. Morgan goes to the court and says, please don't claw back the money 
because we didn't authorize this termination statement to be filed. And therefore, it's ineffective. The lawyer at Mayor Brown, the partner who was involved, submits an affidavit saying that the UCC3 filing was unbeknownst to him. I thought that was interesting language. Unbeknownst to me. The court doesn't buy it. And it goes up on appeal to the federal appellate court, who also doesn't buy it. And the Second Circuit says, even though you didn't intend to release your security, you authorized the filing of the termination statement that had that same effect. So JP Morgan and the other lenders lose their argument about having priority to the 1.5. So what's the fallout here? So everybody's getting sued. Mayor Brown gets sued. Now remember, they made the mistake in the first place, but they represented General Motors. Uh, I'm sorry, they represented uh, they represent General Motors, and the court said, you can't be sued for your mistake by the lenders because you didn't owe any duty to them. Even though you prepared the initial draft of the documents, your duty was only to your client, GM. And in fact, it benefited GM to have all the security released. J.P. Morgan and Simpson Thatcher also got sued in a class action by all this consortium of lenders. That case was dismissed. I don't have any details about what happened. I'm guessing there was a settlement. I'm guessing it involved um, substantial policy limits on the part of those law firms. So moral to this story is double check. If somebody had sat down any point along the road and said either to the paralegal, hey, here's what we're looking for, or got the work product from the paralegal and double checked to make sure, what does this UCC1 financing statement relate to? Which loan does it relate to? If the partner for General Motors had double checked, if the partner at Simpson Thatcher, who should have cared a lot about what was being released, if that partner had double checked, there were numerous opportunities to catch this mistake and nobody did. It can happen to the best lawyers at the best law firms, it can happen to you. So keep this in mind as a word to the wise when you're working on something. Take that extra moment to make sure that it's right before it goes out the door. Lesson number two, I'm calling this one plan ahead. We all get in sticky situations with our schedule where we've got too much going on. There are right ways to handle that situation and wrong ways to handle that situation. This is a very wrong way to handle it. So first, what are the rules that are involved? 3.4C, which deals with knowingly disobeying the obligations of a tribunal. In this case, it's a court. 8.4C, and you'll see this come up a lot over the course of my presentation. This is the rule of professional conduct that prohibits lawyers from involve, being involved in conduct that involves dishonesty, deceit, misrepresentation, 8.4D, conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice. So our heroine in this case is an experienced Minnesota trial lawyer. She's been retained to represent a defendant in a criminal case where there are multiple defendants and the court has set a priority trial date because it's a criminal matter. Now, there's one problem is she has other plans during that trial. So she files a motion for continuance. Great thing to do. And she says in the motion for continuance that she has personal commitments, but she never explains what they are. In the meantime, she buys a non-refundable plane ticket to Paris for her brother's wedding. That's what I call betting on the come. Does anyone want to guess what the judge did with her motion? Denied. Okay, so now what does our heroine do? She says, well, I'll just file a motion to remove the judge from the case. That motion goes to the chief judge. Can you guess what the chief judge did with her motion? Denied. 
How many of you would have just said, you know what, just forget the wedding, I'll just show up at the trial. Not our heroine. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. So she tries again. She files another motion for continuance. This time, she's going to provide a really good explanation. She emails the clerk. And she tells the clerk, I'm incompetent because I have not had time to prepare for the trial, so please let me out. Um, as somebody who does a lot of legal malpractice defense, these are what I call bad documents, where you're admitting that you're incompetent. So I have a personal issue with that. But she, she says, I'm incompetent. Denied. So now it's the day of trial. Everyone's in the courtroom. The judge is up on the bench. You have all the different lawyers for all the different defendants. Her client's sitting right there. You can imagine everyone's like looking around the courtroom like, where's Sue, right? She's not there at all. Doesn't show up. She sends another lawyer who appears as substitute counsel. And it's not clear from what I've read, but I'm guessing this is the very first time the client had even met this person. So substitute counsel shows up and says, I spoke with our heroine. She's in the hospital in Dallas. And we need a continuance of the trial. The court is rightfully skeptical, but also says, I have no choice. I'm going to continue the trial day to day, but I want proof that you actually are in the hospital, Miss Lawyer, and I want proof that you actually had plans to travel from Dallas to Minnesota for the trial. I want to see travel plans, tickets, all those things. And by the way, if a judge is asking for these things from you, your credibility is not very good. You've heard that credibility is the most important thing for a trial lawyer. I'm guessing she has zero at this point. So she sends information to the law clerk. She sends heavily redacted documents that at least appear to show that she was hospitalized in Dallas. But she says, you know, it's too soon for me to be back in court. The problem is that it wasn't just the judge who didn't trust her. None of the other parties trusted her either. So, by the way, a prosecutor starts investigating and finds out that, in fact, the morning after emailing the court, she booked a flight from Dallas to Paris, boarded a flight from Dallas to Paris, with a connection in Minnesota which is where the trial was going to be. So she's off to the wedding. And she never tells the judge that she has done that. So what happened to her? The judge commences contempt proceedings against her. It actually goes to a jury trial where she is found guilty of criminal contempt. She is indefinitely suspended from the practice of law and the opinion that imposed that sanction on her, cited as aggravating factors that she showed no remorse for what she had done, no understanding of why what she had done was wrongful. So she is not going to be practicing law anytime soon. So hopefully the wedding was worth it. So there are things that she could have done differently, any number of things she could have done differently. First of all, when the client called her and said, I need representation, and she found out what the trial date was going to be, if it was a problem for her not to attend the wedding, she could have simply turned down the representation and said, I don't have the ability to do it because of my personal commitments. You're going to need to find another lawyer. She could have told the client, I'll take this on if the judge grants a continuance. And if the judge doesn't grant a continuance, then you will need to find another lawyer. She should have gotten substitute counsel on board sooner because the first motion for continuance was filed three weeks before trial. If that was going to be an issue, she should have gotten substitute counsel on board then. Any number of things she, sh she should have done differently that she didn't do in connection with this. So lesson number three. I'm going to call this one, don't fudge your time. Unfortunately, 
most of us in this room need to track our days in six minute increments. It's how we get compensated for the work that we do, and it's also how lots and lots of lawyers get in trouble. Sometimes they get in trouble because they just are not doing a good job of tracking their time. Sometimes they get in trouble because they're being dishonest with their time. Here, uh, the rule of the road I want you to look out for is 1.5a, which talks about charging your client a reasonable amount, both in terms of your fees as well as the expenses you charge. And the same one we saw before, 8.4c, which comes up a lot in attorney disciplinary proceedings, dishonesty, deceit, misrepresentation. So our hero here is actually a really good lawyer. This is an Ohio lawyer who represented indigent clients. And the court would pay this lawyer for the representation. She had a great reputation for being hardworking, for being dedicated to her clients. The problem was she wasn't good at tracking her time. And she wasn't keeping adequate records. She merely guessed at the time that she had spent on cases. And I'm guessing that what happened is by the time she was filling out her time to submit to the court, she'd forgotten what she did and was just making things up. Maybe it was her best guess, but she was making things up. The Problem is that she wasn't very good at math because on occasion she billed more than 24 hours in a day and sometimes more than 20 hours in a day. And somebody at the court noticed that and thought, that's really weird, and brought this up, and they started looking into it. She was suspended for two years from the practice of law. Again, it's not because she had bad intent, but it's because she was doing something that, despite her good intent, was dishonest at the end of the day. Um, in my firm, I tell our lawyers, track your time daily, because if you don't, then the more time that passes, the more you're just guessing about what's happening. Or you're losing time because you forget you do things and you're not tracking them, you're not billing for them, and you're not being paid for the good work that you do. Um, none of which is good, which means track your time contemporaneously and that way you have a good record of what you've done. And when I'm representing lawyers who are being sued, one of the very first things I do is go to the billing record. And it makes my life a lot easier in defending the lawyer if the billing records are accurate and if the lawyer is methodical in tracking their time. The worst cases I've dealt with are ones where it's obvious that the lawyer was not very good in tracking their time and it's obvious that there are inaccuracies in the billing record because that then creates issues about how honest anything that the lawyer is saying is going to be. Next. We have a California lawyer. This was the lawyer who was hired by an insurance company to work on different cases. And here, he billed the insurance company more than 24 hours a day on some days and more than 100 hours a day on other days. <laughs> um, he's much more efficient than any of us in this room, but he was disbarred as a result of this conduct. And the reason he was found is because the insurance company was auditing the bills and noticed the massive number of hours that were being billed here. Um, my firm actually has a, a new accounting software that will not let people bill more than 24 hours a day. Uh, not that anyone would do it on purpose, I hope, but if somebody, instead of putting 0.5, accidentally puts five and it bumps it up over 24 hours, we have a built-in double check that will say, hey, wait a minute, something's off here and that way the lawyer will know I made an error in my time entry. Um, I'm, I know for sure this wasn't simply an error in time entry and the regulatory authorities obviously found the same thing. Now we have the fraudulent expense submitter. Our hero in this scenario was a lawyer at Sidley Austin. Again, massive firm, very well respected. And this guy was a partner in their Chicago office he was a member of the firm's executive committee. I don't know how much money he made, but I'm guessing it was in the seven figures. He didn't need the money, but he forged taxicab receipts to the tune of $69,000, 
making up over 800 taxi rides he never took. $69,000 in the context of a guy who's running Sidley and Austin? That's a rounding error on his tax return. And he's stealing $69,000. So he gets found out. He gets suspended for a year, and he gets ordered to go into psychiatric treatment. I mean, he'll be able to practice law again, but his career effectively will never be the same. It's over because he did something that was stupid and he did something that was dishonest. And it could be that he was having substance abuse problems. I mean, if he was having serious psychiatric problems, you'd like to think someone at the firm would have noticed it. But if you need, if you're having those kinds of issues, and we'll talk about this later on, there are ways you can go and get help before it gets to this point. So lesson three and a half, which is no, really, really don't fudge your time. Here we have what I'm going to call the bills to nowhere. This is a lawyer from Louisiana who was at a very large firm in Louisiana, hired out of law school, had a great career there, rose through the ranks as an associate, became a partner in the firm. And he had designs of being part of firm management. He was a rising star. He was the hiring partner. He was the chair of the diversity committee on his way up at his law firm. So his problem was he started billing time. He didn't charge it to a client. He charged it to a closed file for a contingency fee matter. And so over four years, he's billing over 1,000 hours to this ghost file that will never generate a bill that no client will ever pay for and he's doing it. Why? And by the way, they finally notice, hey, he has all these hours, but we're not actually getting this money in. Like, what's going on? So he did it because he wanted to look good, because he was looking around at other people in his firm. And he was saying, you know, this person down the hall is billing more hours than me, and this person's billing more hours than me, and I'm on the path to management, and I want to be viewed as being a hard worker at the firm, I want to be viewed as being a big biller at the firm, so I'm going to inflate my hours. The interesting thing is, when his false entries were taken out of his time, he still exceeded his billing requirements. And it probably wouldn't have even affected his year in bonuses. It made no difference at the end of the day to his compensation, to his career path. But by doing what he did, he destroyed his career. So the Louisiana Disciplinary Board said that even though no clients were harmed, what he did was dishonesty. Even if his client wasn't harmed or his firm wasn't harmed, this is not something that lawyers can do. It's a violation of 8.4. So what they said is he violated duties owed to the public and to the profession, and that even if nobody was actually harmed, what he did was the type that damages the image of the legal community, and that simply the potential for harm was enough to impose a sanction. So noting that he'd done this over four years, I mean, this wasn't an isolated incident. This was a pattern of dishonest conduct. And the only reason he stopped was because he got caught. They suspended his license for 30 months, and he was forced to resign from his firm in disgrace, all because he wanted to look good. So let's move on to lesson number four, which I'm going to call don't lose your cool and don't be a jerk. Again, things that you should learn when you're in grade school. The rules that we're going to look for here are 4.1a. This seems very similar to the 8.4 rule we saw. And this is the rule that says you shall not make a false statement of material fact when you're practicing law. You, you shouldn't lie to people when you're practicing law. Simple enough. Again, 8.4C and 8.4G. This is the rule that says lawyers shall not engage in conduct exhibiting or engendering bias. 
So our hero here was a New Jersey lawyer who got into a battle with opposing counsel. And some of the worst offenders are litigators because we're in an adversarial position. The other side's doing things that make us mad and sometimes litigators lose their cool. And it's not okay, even in the context of litigation, to lose your cool. So he was taunting another attorney in what the disciplinary authority called a series of sarcastic and sophomoric emails, saying he whined like a little girl, telling him he should grow a pair. He called the guy a gay slur after a hearing, and this person was suspended for making these wildly inappropriate remarks to opposing counsel. Here's another lawyer in Illinois who again got angry at opposing counsel. This was in the context of a divorce proceeding and he had litigated against opposing counsel who was a female in 17 different cases. So they had a long history together and apparently every time, <laughs> every time they had a case, it just ratcheted things up. So he did something incredibly sophomoric. He started signing her up for magazines, including Pig International, which I looked up, it actually does exist. And it's a magazine for pork producers. Uh, he joined the Obesity Action Coalition in her name. I mean, this, these are things you wouldn't even expect high school kids to do. Incredibly juvenile. Uh, he went on to Facebook and Martindale and he gave her negative reviews. And then he created a fake match.com profile for her. <laughs> he falsely said in the profile that she was divorced. She wasn't. He falsely stated that she smoked and drinked, that she enjoyed auto racing and motocross, and that she has cats. And I'm still trying to figure out why that's disparaging. Maybe he was a dog person, but in any event, uh, he goes on to say her favorite hotspots are the grocery store, all restaurants, all buffets, and NASCAR. <laughs> Very nasty stuff. So they ask him, like, why are you doing this? And he said, well, there's not a simple answer. Part of it was he'd never been more frustrated with anyone than this woman. And he also said, I'm, you know, I wish I had never gone down the road of being a lawyer. I'm just really unhappy in the practice of law. There are lots of lawyers who, from time to time, are unhappy in the practice of law. It's never justification for doing this kind of behavior. So the disciplinary authority said that there was no credible explanation as to why the stress of practicing law, the stress of being a divorce lawyer, could possibly justify the behavior that this lawyer engaged in. And they suspended his license for six months with reinstatement contingent on getting permission from the court to come back in to practice law again. Now, these are things that lawyers have done that we've just seen in the practice of law. But lawyers also do things in their personal lives that get them in trouble. And you don't have to do something in the practice of law to get disciplined. You can be disciplined for things that you do that you may think are completely unrelated to the practice of law. Lawyers get disciplined for DUIs. Lawyers get disciplined for domestic violence. The view of the regulatory authorities is that if you're engaged in conduct that adversely reflects, well, it reflects that you are not the type of person who should be in our profession, that that can be grounds for sanction. So if, you're, if you've been involved in conduct involving dishonesty, that's personal tax fraud. Even if it doesn't relate to your representation of clients, they're gonna view that as relating to your representation of clients. Domestic violence can be viewed as adversely reflecting on your fitness to be a lawyer. So here, the lesson is don't be a jerk in your personal life either. The rules that we have here in this particular fact pattern are number 3.1, which deals with frivolous litigation. Lawyers cannot either bring claims that don't have a basis in fact in law or defend claims 
with defenses that do not have a basis in fact or law. And 4.4, you should not use any means in the legal process that have no purpose other than to harass, burden another person. And 8.4D, which is conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice. In this fact pattern, I'm gonna call this the shrubberies. Many of you may recognize this. This is a scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. The Knights of Knee, you shall bring us a shrubbery. If you haven't seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail, I highly recommend it. Has nothing to do with ethics, but highly recommend the movie. So here we have a Washington lawyer. And this guy was engaged in a five-year battle with his neighbors over, guess what? Shrubberies because they had removed along the property line eight bushes. And he thought they were his bushes and they improperly removed the bushes. So he files two lawsuits against his neighbors over the bushes. He files two administrative appeals relating again to the bushes. And the court found that his legal battle, the court said actually the first lawsuit, that was legitimate but all the subsequent litigation was frivolous. And the only reason that he filed it was to improperly harass his neighbors. He was suspended for 18 months for his behavior in doing that. Here's another example. And here I want you to look for 8.4B violations. This is a criminal act that involves uh, a lawyer's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness as a lawyer in other respects. And 8.4H, this is the rule that prohibits conduct that intentionally and wrongfully harms others that adversely reflects on your ability to practice law. Here we actually have a Colorado lawyer. And he was angry because he was trying to get into his wife's 401k account at Charles Schwab, and he found he was locked out. So he did what any reasonable husband would do which is not to call your wife and say, hey, can you give me your password? You wonder if she would have given it to him. He called Charles Robb and he demanded to be let in. And he told them if they did not let him in, innocent people in their Denver office would be hurt. And the office would be gone. So police were dispatched. He answered the door holding a two foot long antique bayonet. He had his license suspended for six months. Again, you would think this has nothing to do with the practice of law, but it does, because it reflects on your fitness to be a lawyer. Lesson number six, understanding your confidentiality obligations. As a young lawyer, I did not understand my confidentiality obligations, and it it surprises me to this day how few lawyers actually do. 1.6 is the rule that governs client confidences. And I encourage all of you, after you watch Monty Python and the Holy Grail, to read Rule 1.6 because it says, all information relating to the representation of a client is confidential all information relating to the representation of a client. It includes your client's name. It includes things that are public record. The fact that you are representing a client in a lawsuit is confidential. And unless you fall within an exception to 1.6 for divulging that information, you cannot. So you can't go to a party with one of your colleagues or one of your friends and say, hey, yeah, you know, I just took a deposition in that case involving so-and-so client. That's a breach of your duty of confidentiality. So let's look at an example here about lawyers who didn't understand their obligations under 1.6. It's okay to talk, to a, talk about a client as long as I don't name them, right? I mean, you can talk about clients kind of generally and not say who the clients are. Not really, not if the hypothetical that you're posing can be traced back to the client. Here there's an Illinois lawyer who is a public defender and she wrote a blog 
about her work as a public defender. She got into trouble because she didn't identify clients by name on her blog, but she provided information about the clients that if you had public sources you could go to, to look up the information she provided, you could trace it back to her client. So through not too much song and dance, you could figure out who her clients were. So she was suspended for 60 days because she had posted that information on her blog. It's OK to talk to your spouse or your significant other about your cases, right? Wrong. There is a case very recently, two different lawyers in Ohio, they had met um, because they were doing the same kind of practice of law. They were at different firms, but they fell in love, they got engaged, and at night, as lawyers often do, they talk about their work. And here, because they were both involved in the same area of law, which I think was representing schools and school districts, they would talk about particular clients. And they would even ask each other for advice or for draft documents for work that they were doing. And they were found to have violated Rule 1.6. They were suspended for six months apiece which was a fully stayed suspension. Um, so they got a little bit of a break in that it was stayed. But even that was found to be a Rule 1.6 violation. So just keep in mind that when you're talking, and it's natural to want to talk about the work that you do, you just need to be very careful about delineating between what's client confidential information and what's not. And client confidential information does not have to be information given to you by the client. It could be anything about the case. All information relating to the representation of a client, not just attorney-client communications, not just privileged communications. So after telling you not to talk, now I'm going to talk, tell you to talk, this time to your clients. So the lesson here is communicate, communicate, communicate. There's a book that Malcolm Gladwell wrote, and I don't remember which of his books this is in, but he's talking about a study that was done, I think, by Duke University Law School, or Medical School, and they did a study of doctors' bedside manner and the correlation between bedside manner and medical malpractice lawsuits. And I found it really interesting in the context of legal malpractice lawsuits because what this study showed is that if you take the same message to a patient same, you know, the same diagnosis, the same recommended treatment, the only thing you change is the bedside manner of the physician providing the message. It changes the chances that that physician is going to get sued for medical malpractice. It's not the advice that the doctor's giving, it's not the work the doctor's doing, that is necessarily giving rise to the malpractice claim. It's the way that the physician is communicating with the client, with a patient, that gives rise to the malpractice claim. And anecdotally, I've seen this in my practice, that lawyers are often sued not because they did something wrong, not because they did something any one of us in this room would not have done. They're sued because they didn't have a good relationship with their client. They didn't have a good bedside manner, and there are lots of times where lawyers make mistakes, and if you've practiced law for any length of time, you will have made a mistake. And the only thing that saves you from having a claim made against you is that you have a good relationship with your client. And you communicate with them, and they understand, and they forgive you, and you move on. So communication is key, both in terms of preventing claims, in terms of also complying with your rules. Uh, which in this case are 1.3 that I want you to look out for, which is diligence. You have an obligation as a lawyer to represent a client promptly and with reasonable diligence. Communication, you also have a duty as a lawyer to reasonably communicate to your client the things that they will, will need to know in order to be able to make decisions about their case. And if they have questions for you, you have a duty to reasonably and promptly respond to their questions. So here we have our hero, this time being a Nebraska lawyer, who was representing a plaintiff in a personal injury lawsuit. And he was communicating with his client by Facebook. 
which I think is kind of an odd way to communicate with your client, but hey, whatever works in this new media age. The problem was not that he was communicating by Facebook, it was what he was saying with his client over Facebook. He's telling his client things like, relax. I will explain later. I'm busy right now. This is complicated. I can't explain the whole process. And he was suspended for 90 days with a one year probationary period of monitoring. The reason being that when his client was asking him questions, he was just blowing off the client and not actually answering the questions. So he gets a face down on Facebook very appropriately. Lesson number eight, and again, all these things should seem pretty obvious, but don't destroy evidence and then lie about it. It does seem obvious, don't destroy evidence. But lawyers do it with distressing frequency. Lawyers create false evidence with distressing frequency. There is an incident um, many years back, actually here in Colorado, where a lawyer at a very well-respected firm forged an order from a federal court judge who is dying of cancer to release a lien on real property. And that lawyer got disbarred as a result. No case, no client is worth being dishonest. It's far, far better to lose a client's case than to try to win the case at any cost. So here's another example. The rules I want you to look out for are 3.3, candor to the tribunal. 3.4, which talks about fairness to the opposing party and counsel. And our favorite, 8.4C, conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, and misrepresentation. So I'm going to call this case study the I Heart Lawyers case study, and you'll see why in a moment. So our protagonist in this story was a very prominent trial lawyer in Virginia, and he's representing a widower. The widower's wife had been killed when a cement truck rolled over on her car. Horrible, horrible accident. So the lawyer comes in, and he sues the driver of the concrete truck and the company that employed that driver. So the concrete company during discovery learns of a photograph that the widower had posted on his Facebook page. And it shows him holding a beer can while wearing this t-shirt. I mean, he's alleging that he has all these non-economic damages for losing his wife. He's alleging that you know, he's grieving over his wife and he has all this pain and suffering and loss of consortium, and so they find this photo. They say, we want copies of all of your Facebook pages because they think where there's smoke, there's going to be fire, there will be more. So what does our lawyer do? He doesn't say, let me gather all that information. He tells his paralegal to call the widower and tell him to clean up his Facebook page because we don't want any blow-ups of this stuff at trial. Clean it up, delete it, get rid of it. And the paralegal follows those instructions and emails the widower with precisely that. He deletes 16 pictures from his Facebook page as a result. He is then deposed where he lies about having deleted those documents. The concrete company then subpoenas the paralegal and asks for copies of all the emails that she has had with the widower. The court says, if you're gonna withhold any documents by claiming that they're privileged communications, you need to log them as the rules of civil procedure require on a privilege log. The lawyer provides the log, but he intentionally omits any reference to that critical email telling the widower to clean up his Facebook page. So this lawyer not only tells his client to destroy evidence, he intentionally withholds evidence on the privilege log. Talk about making a bad situation worse. So they find the omission, and our hero immediately blames his paralegal. Not a good move. 
Um, he later admits he concealed the email out of fear that the court would grant a continuance of the trial once he saw it. Not a very good excuse. So what happens to him? He was sanctioned personally by the court for over $500,000. And the widower was sanctioned $180,000. And the lawyer had his law license yanked for five years. Again, prominent Virginia trial lawyer, and he's just lost his career. You can't jump back after five years and pick up where you left off. And he, oh, by the way, he's out a half million. Bad stuff happens when lawyers do dishonest things. So that brings me to lesson number nine, which is take responsibility. So we just saw a really good example of someone not taking responsibility, blaming the paralegal, who, by the way, he had a duty to supervise, and who he actually directed to do these bad things. So take responsibility if you make a mistake. So here's what I'm going to call, uh, as far as a case study, the Trump defense. Here we have a lawyer who admittedly stole money from her client. So the client got a settlement, and the lawyer took the settlement into her trust account. Um, the lawyer claimed that she was trying to protect the client because the client had this uncle who was going to take the money. So what did the lawyer do? The lawyer spent it on herself. She bought clothes. She went to restaurants and frittered away $55,000 of the client's settlement. She was disbarred, and her argument against disbarment was, well, Donald Trump does really bad things, and he gets away with it, and so therefore, you should have leniency towards me. That defense didn't work. You also will see instances of what I'll call the Nuremberg defense, where you'll see younger lawyers who will say, well, the senior lawyer directed me to do it. And there's actually a rule of professional conduct that says what the responsibilities of junior lawyers are. And as a junior lawyer, if somebody else tells you to do something and you know that it's wrong, it's not a defense that you are acting under orders. You have violated the rules of professional conduct. The defense is if it's an arguable point, then you can follow the supervising lawyer's directions as to which side of an arguable point to take. But if it's not arguable, you can't do it, even if your supervisor is telling you to. So our next example is the, um, what I'm going to call the I was quoting Kanye defense. Here we have an Ohio lawyer who directed profanity-laced tirades who sexually harassed his paralegal. And his defense was, well, I was just humorously quoting hip hop, ly hip -hop lyrics. He also claimed he had mood swings, depression, and OCD. The court didn't buy those excuses either. And he found that he was suspended one year for his extreme, obnoxious, and humiliating attacks. And interestingly, I mean, this doesn't have anything to do per se, with representing a client. I mean, he's not doing anything that's going to hurt his client necessarily, but he's engaging in conduct that lawyers should engage in, and that impacted his law license. So that brings me to my final lesson, which is when in doubt, ask for help. One of the things that I said earlier is that if you've been practicing law for any length of time, you will have made a mistake. 99% of the mistakes that we make in the practice of law are fixable. Often, the lawyer who's made the mistake doesn't realize that they're fixable. And it takes somebody else who maybe has more experience or just is more objective to sit down and say, here's how we're going to fix the matter going forward. And the vast majority of the time, the error can be fixed without any harm to the client. And so if you find yourself having made a mistake, reach out and ask somebody else to take a look at it and help you fix it. And I'll give you a personal anecdote. I was involved in a trial, and something happened at trial where I thought, you know what? This involves me, and I can't be objective about what the next best step is 
And so I should reach out to someone else at my firm and make sure that I'm handling this the right way. And so that night at the end of the trial day, I emailed another partner at my firm who does legal ethics and said, is this the right thing to do ethically? I like to think I know a lot about ethics, but it involved me. And I knew I couldn't be completely objective. And went and said, help me map out the strategy. So ask for help. If, even if you think you know what the answer is, if it involves you. And often it can be fixed. For the few times where it can't be fixed, that's why you have malpractice insurance. Hopefully you have malpractice insurance. Hopefully you never have to use it. If you have issues of a psychological nature, if you have substance abuse issues, there's help for that too. There are resources through the bar that can provide help. If you're with a law firm, your law firm may have an employee assistance program, other resources that can provide help for you. So reach out and get that help when you need it. Even if it's just you need someone to talk to, you're just under a lot of stress, do what you need to do to make sure that you're not letting it impact your law practice and your law license. So I want to leave some room for questions, discussion. I could regale you with stories all day long, um, but I want to have a little bit of a conversation too. So don't, don't leave me standing up here, guys. Um, questions from the audience? Yes. Um, what, it was true that he was within the shrubbery thing. So the whole, it, like, a lot of your cases, I have trouble with, like, separating out what people are doing that's obviously obnoxious and the true work that they're doing. You know, the cement truck guy, if he was drunk and, you know, and he ran over the woman, then how did the guy that's the widower get $180,000, you know? Like, to me, it makes me question the, the practice of, of law, period. What, like, what happened in these cases? So let me, the so real you raise. The stuff behind it. So you raise, you, you raise two cases as an example. You ask kind of like, what, what happened and how do we draw the line, basically? So with respect to what we've called the shrubbery case, the court, found that, and all my information I'm getting is from public sources that I'm able to glean, because these are not my cases. I mean, I understand Rule 1.6. None of these cases are ones I have had any involvement whatsoever. These are not my clients. So what I've been able to find out about the shrubbery case is the first lawsuit was legitimate. He had a legitimate dispute with his neighbors over shrubberies. Fair enough. But then he engaged in a battle. And because, keep in mind, he has a law license, and they don't. And I think one of the things, this is my speculation about what the court was looking at there, is that because he had a law license, he could file lawsuit after lawsuit with very little cost to him. All it cost him was his time. But he was forcing his neighbors to hire legal counsel to defend themselves. So he didn't just file one lawsuit, he filed a second lawsuit. And then he filed appeal after appeal, and that's what got him in trouble because the court said he had crossed the line from a legitimate dispute with his neighbors to harassing his neighbors. And that's where that lawyer got over the line and crossed over into an ethical violation. But why would he bother to in the first place? In the same way that why would someone bother to charge for 100 hours or to charge for 24 hours? Maybe they were working 24 hours. Maybe they were dedicated. Maybe they were. So the question is, why would somebody do something like that? I think anger drives a lot of this. I think, especially when you're talking about- You can about, be angry and be a lawyer too. You can or be drop angry. Drop your law practice because you're, you happen to, you know. Yeah, you can, the, I think the moral of the story is not that you shouldn't be angry because we're human, <clears throat> we get angry. The moral is that you need to keep in mind that you can't just react. So if you're angry at opposing counsel, craft the email, <coughs> leave it overnight and come back the next day and read it and make sure it's what you want to say and make sure that's professional before you send it. We have to act professionally, despite how we may personally feel about things. Well, then he's suited for the other law, law practices he brought up with the, with the shrubbery. But the first case should go through. It oh. shouldn't be, you know. So, and then you asked about the concrete case, like where's the justice, right, in the concrete case? 
the, if the widower had behaved appropriately in the litigation, yeah, he had this t-shirt with a stupid message and they had a picture of it. That might have impacted his damages, but it seems to me it's a pretty clear, clear case of liability. He's gonna get something in the lawsuit. He may not get as much as he wants because of the shirt. But where he got in trouble is he was destroying evidence. And even if you have a legitimate claim, if you engage in that kind of behavior and litigation, judges can sanction you, including by throwing out a legitimate claim because of your own bad conduct. So he had nobody to blame but himself and frankly his lawyer for the fact that they took what should have been a legitimate claim and they turned it into a case where they had to write a check for, I'm guessing that amount of money was for the concrete co company's legal fees and having to fight the litigation. And it's two separate cases, pretty much. It should be. You're saying, what should be two separate cases? There should be a case on the concrete truck and why it rolled over and killed the woman, and there should be a case on the bad practices involved. Um, that's one view, but actually that's not the case. The case is that if there's one case, and if you engage in bad conduct and litigation, no matter how meritorious your claims, you can be sanctioned. Those sanctions can include exclusion of evidence. Those sanctions can include throwing out your entire lawsuit if you're the plaintiff. Those sanctions can include striking every affirmative defense you have if you're a defendant. And that's fair because the courts need to know that people are dealing with one another in the context of litigation in an honest fashion. And if you don't deal with the other side in an honest fashion, you shouldn't get to defend yourself or you shouldn't get to prosecute claims if your conduct rises to that level. So universal it is throughout the world? Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's universal throughout the world, but, but it's, it's certainly the rule in Colorado in federal courts and in um, other courts I've been in. So what? Over here. I was going to ask, you serve as a board, on the board of directors for a nonprofit in a non lawyer capacity, and they ask you to review a contract or that kind of stuff. And, you know, you just have to tell them, I'll look at it, but not in the sense of a lawyer. So, have you, are there issues with that about lawyers serving on nonprofits? Yes. Yes. So, there are issues with lawyers serving in what I'll call dual, these dual capacities where you're wearing different hats. And the danger of wearing different hats is you can get into conflict of interest situations because it's not clear which hat you're wearing. And that can cause confusion with the board that you're sitting on. It can also impact things like, is it covered by malpractice insurance? If a claim is later made that you made a mistake. So as a general rule, I think it's really a great practice to clearly delineate the roles. If you're going to be a board member, say, I can't provide legal advice. I can help you find a lawyer who can help us get legal advice, but I'm not going to be the person to do that because it blurs the roles. Do we have the? Just a clarification on the GM case. Uh, the uh, attorneys for the debtor uh, prepared the original documents for the releases of the security instruments, but but I'm assuming that those were then passed on in draft form to the attorneys for the creditors. Correct. And they actually passed on the documents and sent them off for signatures. So both sides were pretty brain dead. Uh, <laughs> uh, both sides completely missed it. You're exactly right. It was drafted by the lawyers for the debtor. It was reviewed by the lawyers for the creditors who, by the way, said, great job on the documents. So they looked at them. They just completely blew the fact that they were releasing security they did not mean to release. I think we have some questions over here. Can we get the microphone? I, I had a question now. about the case with the spouses who breached confidentiality. How did the complaint come about in that case? I would assume that they wouldn't tell on each other. So uh, my recollection, the, my recollection is I don't I don't think either one ratted each other out. My <laughs> recollection is that their law firms found out about it, and these are law firms that are engaged in again the same type of work and they found out that they were talking to one another and sharing information and getting advice from one another, and that's how this came to light. Do you think Yes, sir. Um, I'm sure no one here wants to talk politics, and, and, and I don't want to, but 
uh, it's been reported that a certain national organization uh, decided to sponsor some kind of training for uh, clerks for the federal courts and that th those uh, people from uh, very top-notch law schools were then asked uh, to participate but to sign a pledge that they would remain loyal to the uh, goals of that certain organization. And it seems to me that that raises some ethical considerations for any lawyers involved in that. Um, a, a question about whether that's uh, conducive to the proper administration of justice. So Would you I'm, comment? I, I'm not going to comment on politics either, but I will say that there's a rule of professional conduct that prohibits lawyers from agreeing to restrict their ability to practice law. Um, this usually comes up in the context of settlement agreements, where there's a fight with a plaintiff and typically a defendant who's, who's dealing with lots of the same kind of litigation. And sometimes you'll see that the defendant says, well, can we require the plaintiff's lawyer to not sue us on behalf of other plaintiffs in the same kind of case because they know all about our product, they, you know, they've kind of worked up this case against us, we want to shut down the plaintiff's lawyer. And so there had been attempts in the past by defendants to say, well, let's either hire them so that now they represent us and they can't be adverse to us, or get a contractual obligation from them not to take on those kinds of cases in the future. And that violates the rules of professional conduct because you can't restrict a lawyer's ability to practice law. There have been cases where um, non-compete agreements have been uh, entered into by lawyers, and then later on an employer, a law firm, will try to enforce a non-compete agreement against a lawyer. And courts have said that those are impermissible restrictions on a lawyer's ability to practice law. So I haven't looked at your precise scenario, but I would be very, uh, I will say, interested to see whether or not that would be an unauthorized restriction on the practice of law because you're asking the lawyer to promise that they will or will not do certain things going forward. And I'm asking more about the effect on the administration of justice because there's a potential ethics question too. Yeah. Okay. Big bigger issues for uh for other folks. Okay. Yes. I, I was just going to ask, how often do you sometimes see different rules come into conflict with each other? So for instance, I, I was um, I was trying a case and the other side um, had, had re which was represented by uh, a non-attorney, it was a kind of a pro se attorney, had requested documents from a third party um, and specifically phone records from a third party and their attorney went and said, well, we're gonna provide these but it's got some sensitive information um, and, it was, and it was actually from that law firm, uh, their phone records and sensitive information about clients that we've contacted, et cetera, and, and had tried to move to quash it and in, in my opinion, the judge had made a severe error in in um, going through this process and had ordered completely unredacted um, phone records um, that were going to become public uh, that included some sensitive information about about clients that weren't even involved at all in this uh, this litigation so I'm wondering how often you see that sort of conflict where okay well we've got a duty to protect those clients whose phone numbers are on this list and the information there in the phone records versus, you know, be, you know, a tribunal and, and providing evidence, documentation to tribunals. Does that happen frequently where you have these conflicts? Uh, it happens all the time when lawyers are involved as parties in litigation or as recipients of subpoenas in litigation. And you do have an obligation under Rule 1.6, but there are exceptions to Rule 1.6 and the duty of confidentiality. And so lawyers can reveal information that would otherwise be covered as confidential information if they're parties in litigation and they need to reveal it to defend themselves, what I call the self-defense exception, or if there's a court order. So if you get a subpoena and you raise all the legitimate objections, including confidentiality, and a court orders you to produce it, you can comply with the court order without violating Rule 1.6. So um, I would caution that if you don't comply with a court order that's um, going to subject you to a lot of other potential blowback. You could appeal it, certainly. You could try to take any other 
a, pro a proper recourse, but simply disobeying the court order is not permitted by Rule 1.6. So that's not a reason to disobey the court. <laughs> I moved in-house and out of state a number of years ago, but when I was in private practice, we required both our paralegals and all of our support staff to take ethics training so that they would understand their obligations. Has there been any move to make that sort of training mandatory for legal departments and uh, law firms? No, in fact, I mean, there's no mandatory training for lawyers as far as what law firms or legal departments should be doing internally. We, cert of course, have CLE requirements. I'm not aware that there's any move afoot to, to mandate that. I think it's great practice to do that. And in fact, one of the things that we do at my firm is we talk to staff um, and we try to create a very open environment where staff can feel free to report to management things that happen because a lot of times the staff, they're the first people to identify a problem. If a lawyer has a substance abuse pro problem, if a lawyer is you know, inflating their time, uh, often staff will see that. And so we try to create an environment where staff will come to us and identify that so we can try to help the lawyer and know that there's an issue. If staff don't feel that they can speak up, then often, even though the staff see this happen, it just keeps going and going and going. So I think having training to let the staff know, here are the rules and here's what's acceptable and what's not, and, and we really want you to speak up. And if you see something, say something. I think that's a great message. I bet, I bet. Carolyn, great presentation thank oh. you my question was um you know the rule about it's an we have an obligation to report something that we see how often have you seen cases where people have been um found in violation of that rule because they haven't reported something can you give an example of that yeah so there is a rule um, i think it's 8.3 if i'm remembering correctly that imposes on lawyers an ethical obligation to report ethical misconduct by other lawyers. Um, the question is, has that actually been enforced? The answer is very, very, very rarely. So rarely that I think it is almost, um, I'll say it, it's hard to think of a scenario where you would actually have an obligation to report another lawyer under that rule. There's one case, I think it's called Himmel out of, it might be Indiana, where a lawyer was actually suspended for a year for failing to report another lawyer. The circumstances of that case were pretty unique in that they had both been representing the same client, the offending lawyer had stolen money from the client, and the lawyer who was found to have violated Rule 8.3 did not report that theft of client funds to the regulatory authorities. Usually where I see this come up and people are asking me, do I have an obligation to report, it's in the context of opposing counsel. And you say, well, opposing counsel did this heinous thing. Do I have an obligation to report them? Almost always the answer is no, you don't have an obligation. And there's also a danger in reporting because there's also a rule that says that if you threaten to report somebody for the purpose of gaining an advantage in litigation, or if you actually report somebody solely to gain an advantage in litigation, then that is in and of itself an ethical violation. So what they don't want you to do is use a, a threat of a report or an actual report as gamesmanship in the context of an adversarial proceeding. So to, usually where there's litigation involved and this comes up, um, my thought is it's best to wait until the litigation's done. And then if you think that you should report, then do it. And I will say, even if you don't have an obligation to report, that's not to say you can't report. You don't have to satisfy the 8.3 criteria in order to make a report. You just need to make sure that you're not doing it in a way that is in and of itself a problem for you. So do you have an obligation to report? Almost never um, for another lawyer. And then a related question is, do you have an obligation to self-report? you almost never have an obligation to self-report. There are instances where you do. You have an obligation to self-report if you are convicted of a crime, you have to report that. Or if you are the subject of discipline in another jurisdiction, 
you need to report that too. There are times where it may be a good idea for you to self-report from a strategic perspective because you want to get ahead of the issue. You want to go to the Office of Attorney Regulation Counsel and fall on your sword and you, by doing it, would hope to get more lenient treatment. But you don't have, with again, just a couple of exceptions, an obligation to report your own misconduct, although you certainly can report your own misconduct. We have a question back here. in sexual misconduct and they didn't report it. Um, so there may be some situations, I, I certainly am aware of at least one, where, where the duty to report someone else may have arisen in the context of being aware of harassment that you didn't report. Uh, and that, you know, that, could be, that could be true. The Himmel case was from many, many years ago, certainly before the Me Too movement. Um, I will say that in the context of self-reporting, one thing that lawyers sometimes overlook goes back to Rule 1.6. I said people lack understanding, in my experience, of Rule 1.6. The self-reporting, or not self-reporting, the reporting requirement of reporting another lawyer's violation of an ethical rule cannot trump Rule 1.6. Rule 1.6 trumps. So what that means is, even if you know of a lawyer's misconduct, and even if that misconduct rises to the level that it must be reported, unless you can do it without violating Rule 1.6, you cannot make the report. So if you learn that information in the representation of a client, if that's how you learned of it, then it is information relating to the representation of a client. It's confidential. Unless the client authorizes you to make the report, you can't do it. And there are lots of reasons why a client may or may not want you to go down that road. So one thing to keep in mind is not only do you satisfy the criteria, but can you make the report without running afoul of your own 1.6 obligations? Uh, thank you. You've got my interest peaked a bit on 1.6. I have an acquaintance, um, a Facebook friend who's a lawyer who uh, regularly, or at least occasionally, uh, posts rulings that they've obtained um, from a, a court or administrative body, and then discusses them a little bit and just says, "Hey, here's what I'm up, I'm up to. Isn't this great?" Uh, you know, sort of thing. Uh, and it sounds like that may be uh, poor practice. Um, yes, unless <laughs> unless your friends or your colleagues client has authorized him or her to actually post that information, I'm guessing they violated Rule 1.6. Right. Uh, it's public record. And so many lawyers think it's public record. I get to talk about it. You don't. 1.6 has no exception for things that are public record. And lawyers just misunderstand that all the time. So posting something, even if it's a public court filing, that is a violation of 1.6 unless you fall within the exceptions. Now, one exception is that if it's impliedly authorized by the representation, then you get to do it. That's why we get to file things in court, saying, here's our, you know, I represent so-and-so, because it's impliedly authorized that if someone has retained you to represent them in a piece of litigation, you're going to have to file things. You're going to have to identify yourself as their lawyer. You're going to have to do things in connection with a court case. But what it sounds like your colleague is doing is not something that's necessary for representing the client in the court case, it would not be impliedly authorized. So um, you may want to take him out for coffee and tell him, hey, Carolyn says cut it out. So I'll say it depends. So it depends how specific or nonspecific you're being. I mean, this goes back to the public defender and the fact that she wasn't identifying her clients, but she put up enough information that piecing it together, you could figure out from public sources who her clients were. 
So best practice is just ask the client. Say, hey, would you mind if I post it on my website or my Facebook page that we got this great result for you? And some clients are fine even being identified. Other clients will say, hey, yeah, I'm fine with you doing it as long as you don't identify me by name. But if you get the client's permission, you say, here's what I want to post, and they bless it, you're golden. If you don't have the client's permission, I think you need to be really careful about how specific you're being, because if it can be traced to the client easily, then you could find yourself in the same position as a public defender. Some clients really don't want information about themselves posted, and you may find that you have a client relations issue too if you didn't ask the client or if you asked them and they said no and you posted it anyway. So best practice is just talk to the clients. My experience has been as long as they're, um, you know, as long as you're dumbing down the message a little bit as far as taking out information specific to them, most of them are fine with having you post that information. Yeah. Carolyn, um, what do we do when we're trying cases and JVR calls us, jury verdict reporter, they call us, they ask us what the result of our trial is and offers, I mean, we all give it to them. Um, and I've never thought to call the client up and say, hey, uh, JVR is talking to me about this case. Do I have consent? I mean, obviously that's a better practice, but I'll bet you that 95% of us who try cases have never asked. And, you know, uh, Sarah calls us up and says, I, I want to know what happened in your trial. And we say, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so how do we handle it? <laughs> so that happens. And, you know, I'll, they're going to publish about the case regardless. I mean, there's going to be something in Jury Verdict Repub uh, Reporter. It's public information. They got it without talking to you. They're going to publish regardless. The question is whether you add information to that voluntarily. I think best practice, again, is calling up the client and saying, here's, I got a call from Sarah, here's what I want to tell her, are you okay with that? Um, and I want to tell her who our experts were, um, I want to tell her that we're going to file a post-trial motion, those kinds of things. It always surprises me, for those of you who aren't litigators and who don't get the jury verdict reporter, every time there's a jury trial in Colorado State Court, it gets published in a reporter and it says what the outcome is. And there's a section in it where it will say what the settlement offers were that were made before trial. And that always shocks me that lawyers are divulging settlement information in the jury verdict reporter. And I'm always sit there just incredulous thinking to myself, I wonder if their client knows that they did this. I mean, it's, it seems to me that it's even one more step towards, wow, you're really d revealing that, where it's not public information. It's a private settlement discussion. And I think a lot of clients would, if they knew that it was being reported in the jury ver verdict reporter, would be none too happy about it. So I would say, talk to the client, um, let them know what you want to do, and make sure that they're OK with it, and then call Sarah back and say, here it is. Learn something new every day. Yes. Well, but they can only post it if you give it to them. So that's fine. Yes. Oh, I, I was just going to actually just that, add to that because I, I regularly, I, I, I had a lot of clients who I regularly had to talk to reporters about. Um, and so I, you know, I, I typically would have an email trail with, with uh, clients just saying, hey, you have issues that may, you know, get, may get some publicity. Um, what are you authorizing me to do? And then typically also in reporter calls, because I've actually had the situation where I could not confirm or deny that I represented any client, <laughs> um, which is an interesting situation to be in. And so when they've called, I just say, you know, um, I'm going to have to get back to you with that. Um, and I know people a lot of times want to just talk to the reporter right then, just say, hey, do you have a deadline? When is it? What's the contact? I can get back to you, and I'll get back to you later about it without kind of it's a hard dance to play, but I think most are used to doing that. Yeah, like I say, I mean, I had no idea as a young lawyer um, how broad the confidentiality requirements were, and so many lawyers just don't really understand that. Yes? Uh, on the uh, uh, offers of settlement, I'd say, I'm a district court judge, I'd say about 25% of the cases that I have, although the rule says you serve a offer of settlement, they get filed. 
And that's where, I think that's where uh, jury verdict reporter gets a lot of that information, is it is, you know, and when I see that, I never open it. <laughs> you know, that's why it says serve and not file those. But yeah, that's, that's where a lot of that information comes from. And I think that in itself is an ethical obligation. I, I agree. And I, I, you know, that's a fascinating thing to hear from, from you as a judge because you're exactly right. Um, there's, again, for those of you who aren't litigators, there's a statute in Colorado that allows parties to serve offers of settlement. And it basically allows you to engage in a little bit of hedging. So it involves cost shifting. So if the other side gets, for example, a verdict against you, but it's less than the offer of settlement, then it shifts costs, which can include expert expenses. It can include deposition expenses. So it allows you to hedge your bets a little bit. It, the rule says that you serve but don't file the offer of settlement. The only time you ever file it is later in the case if you want to enforce it as an actual order of the court. And so lawyers who are filing that are, number one, violating the rule that says you serve but don't file, but they're also divulging information relating to the representation of a client that unless the client has told them, I want you to file this for some strategic reason, which I am guessing is never the case, then they have violated Rule 1.6. So that's a really interesting thing to hear. So I promised everyone an engaging Saturday morning. I think the questions show that happened. Let's give a big thanks to Carolyn. Again, I hope everyone will join us immediately afterwards for the homecoming barbecue. And go Buffs. Have a great day.